ones, like the Corolla oh, markers. Yeah. And like it they really smell smelled good. strong. Wait, I don't know what they call it, which is actually heavy in Korean. Actually, you know, right? They call it egg like powder, which is like coloring your pencil. Yeah. Except it was literally just the like the it's coloring not. part, not even the pencil part. Oh. And it was just put into a plastic tube. Is it like? And you turn it, yeah. Oh yeah, I saw that when I was at a cafe the other week because they gave my nephew the like the crayons to play with, like to color in, and it was like a twisty one. And I was like, oh man, these are really good quality crayons too. So yeah, I, I've never yeah. seen it. And they used to smell like nice, like. Oh no, that wasn't a smell. <laughs> no, I'm thinking about the markers that I grew up with. They 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 definitely had a smell, like a really strong smell. Something like it's a brand name. I'll look it up. Anyway, we should start our notes. <laughs> All right, team. So let us talk about what we're doing for spec. The reason why I want us to spend so much time on the identification, not the identification, the, yeah, the isomer questions uh, was because the skill set you're using for those isomer identifications is very similar to what you're going to be doing for spec. It's just the information they give you are going to be is a little bit different. Um, so you are going to be getting three different types of spectra to figure out your unknown organic molecule. The three that you're going to get, and I'll write them down so you guys know what we're looking at. Uh, the first one that we're talking about is the IR spectra. So the IR spectra, which is also known as the infrared, that one there is going to tell us what functional group you have. So you guys were already starting to do that with your NCA questions. If you remember, you got the identification uh, test information. And basically, if it was positive, it would react with tolans. If it was negative, it wouldn't react with tolans. So let me show you what I mean. So this over here, if you guys remember, uh, tolans is a test for aldehyde and then a form of silver mirror. If there's no silver mirror forming, then that's a ketone. So that is an example of an identification test to help figure out what your functional group is. Same thing when we're doing... Um, Acids and bases, we're looking at litmus paper. If we're doing dichromate or permanganate, we're looking to see if there's an alcohol or aldehyde. Um, so same sort of skill set, except we're now using a different bit of data, which is actually better to use. Um, are we okay with that so far? All right, so that'll be the first one we talk about. The second one we're gonna be talking about is mass spec. Now, this one here gives us two important bits of information. The first important bit of information is that it can tell us the number of carbons. So if you guys remember, the reason why you guys knew how many carbons were there is because they gave you the formula. When I give you these questions, sometimes I will give you the formula, and I will only give you the empirical formula, and I'll explain the difference between empirical and molecular when we get to that. Um, other times, um, you won't be given any formula at all, so you need to use that mass spec data to figure it out. Um, I, I'll move on to the other one and go back. The last type of spectrum we're going to use is the CMMR data. Now, this one will tell us unique carbon environments. So together with the mass spec and the CMMR, we can figure out the structure. So with all that information, the functional group and the structure, I'll then be able to figure out what the molecule is. Are we okay with that so far? So there's three spectra. We're going to do IR, mass spec, CMMR, and then back to mass spec as well. So that's the order we're doing things in, just FYI. Um, we also won't be looking at solving the molecule in one uh, just today. It's going to be over a couple days because I need to teach you guys each spectra, and then we'll combine it all together. Are we good so far? Mm -hmm. All right. Just out of curiosity, uh, when you guys go to university and you take the organic chemistry paper, they're going to add one more spectra for you to look at, and that's going to be the H uh, MMR, which is the hydrogen um, MMR. So just keep in mind that that's going to be the next layer of the information. Level three, you don't have to worry about that. We okay so far? All right. So CM, or sorry, not CMMR. Uh, the IR spectra is the one we're focusing on today. And let me explain to you guys how that machine works. You guys have some example data of what the IR spectra looks like. 
This is on your personal uh, student resource sheet. I figured you guys probably will want images of each uh, spectra to help you classify what's what. Um, so that's why I've given that to you. Now what you guys are going to notice when you're looking at this is that on the bottom it talks about wavelengths. So, and on your resource sheet it also refers to wavelengths. So you have all your different functional groups and it says specifically what wavelengths you'd expect things to be at. Uh, and we're going to learn how to identify the different functional groups based off of this IR spectra. The hardest thing about this is just learning how to recognize it. You have to do lots and lots of practice, so that way you can kind of see and distinguish what's what. But once you have that down, it's not too bad. Um, the other thing you'll notice when you're looking at the IR spectra is you have something called absorbance. So that's looking at how much light does that absorb. So let's first go over the wavelengths. When we are talking about light, and if you guys are doing physics, light comes in different wavelengths. And I'm trying to make it smaller now. Um, so you have different wavelengths, and then that is referring to the different types of light. Now because I am such a bad artist, let's actually look at a nicer picture of what that is. I can actually do nicer ones. I didn't want to print this out because I didn't think it was terribly crucial, but this is a good way to kind of think about it. So what you'll notice with the wavelengths is you can have some really, really big wavelengths. You have wavelengths that can be the size of like buildings. Uh, those are going to be your radio waves. So when you are listening to the radio in the car, it's because of these wavelengths that are being transmitted from the radio station. Um, they can get smaller and smaller. Uh, and when they get smaller and smaller, they have more and more energy. So the wavelength becomes shorter, they have higher energy, um, and eventually you get to the point where we have things like gamma radiation, which can cause cancer. And that's stuff that you see in nuclear blasts. Um, there are other things that we also deal with, like x-rays. That's how we get the images of our bones and things like that. Again, that is a narrow wavelength, and so that's going to have more energy. The reason why you wear those lead... Um, aprons whenever you get an x-ray is to help protect the organs that are not being x-rayed at that moment because again that can also cause cancer and that's how uh, Marie Curie died and I think or was it Marie Curie was she doing for the x-rays or am I thinking of Rosalind Franklin I think I'm thinking of Rosalind Franklin they were working with x-rays before we knew how dangerous x-rays were and then they died <laughs> from cancer um, ultraviolet is what we talk about coming from the sun and um, that's why we wear sunscreen and things like that that is also a known um, cancer causing agent so these are all various wavelengths of light. We can only see a very narrow range of light, which is known as the visible spectrum, and that's what's causing the different colors. And that's, again, related to how the wavelengths look. Uh, microwaves, these ones are genuinely the ones that are in your microwave that heat up your food. And then infrared is what we're talking about with this current uh, technology. So what will you do when you are looking at an IR data is... You will have a little cuvette, is what we call this. This is how the machine works. You put it in the machine, and it'll have a liquid of whatever unknown substance you were trying to identify. What you do is you shine light at that cuvette, and then you measure the percentage of what has been absorbed. Now, don't worry, you never have to explain how these machines work on the assessment. It's just to give you background information so you know what you're looking at. So, I have a sample, I shine light at it, and then I measure how much light has been absorbed, and then that is what's creating this data over here. So, these are the different wavelengths. Um, as we're going from 500 to 400, so the wavelengths are getting bigger, and each wavelength that we shine at it, we then measure the absorption value and then it dips down if it's going to be very absorbed. Are we okay with that so far? All right, so let's use this to talk about functional groups and how we figure out functional groups. So with functional groups, they will absorb light at a specific wavelength and they will consistently do that over and over again. Because they consistently do that, we can use that to then identify them. There's a couple of markers that are going to be consistent that you'll see throughout. 
Uh, the first one is the CH mark. So you'll see that CH is over here, over here, over here, over here, and over here. And again, if we look at our resource sheet, let me just zoom out so you can see all the ones that I've noted. So you see alkanes, CH, that's between uh, 2850 to 3000, and you can see consistently there, that's roughly at that point. Now, that one isn't worth noting when you're doing your write-up because all organic molecules should have carbon and hydrogen because that's what organic chemistry is. Um, but the reason why I point it out is because it's a very good reference marker. It's kind of like when you're trying to navigate the city, it's a really good pointer to look at. Like I look at the Sky Tower, and that to me gives me a reference of where I am in, Scot um, in Auckland. And when I look at this IR spectra, I look for the CH ones because that gives me a reference point of what I'm looking at function group-wise. You good? All right. So let's talk about some of the things to note. I really don't like how I copied that image because I think I did a white. It's not like all the way down, which is a little annoying. All right. The first one that's really important to look, look at is going to be your carbonyls. So that there at roughly 1,700. are where carbonyls are at. So C double bond O, again, if we look at our resource sheet, we can see that aldehydes and ketones, that would have that C double bond O. The amides would have the C double bond O. And the carboxylic acids and the derivatives also have that C double bond O. So it's a quite a common um, marker for organic molecules. Now, depending on what else is there, it can tell you then what type of function group you have. So when I'm looking at this, I can see that I have a mark at 1700. That is a carbonyl. If I look at some of the other examples, you see how over here, I look again at 1700. Do you see a peak? Or should I say a trough because it's going down? Anything here at 1700? Yes or no? No. So one of the things that's going to be important about this assessment is not only identifying what's there, but what is not there. So if I look, no 1700 peak. I look over here. That's 1,500, that's 2,000, so that's roughly at 1,700. I have another C double bond O. So if there is a peak? If there is a peak, then you do have a carbonyl. But that's not a peak because you're on that one. Oh, that's why I should say troughed. You have a troughed. Oh. I, I say peak because the other ones we talk about things as being peaks. It's just, peak, trough. But I should say trough. All right. These two here, I want you guys just to be mindful that even though there's this trough here at 1700, that's not a carbonyl because the carbonyls go like all the way down near 200. So that one, that one, this one over here, again, that would be a C double bond O. So we start to see things. So we're checking to see is there carbonyls. Carbonyl could mean a lot of things. Carbonyl could mean I have an aldehyde, a ketone. It could mean I have a carboxylic acid. It could mean I have an amide. Are we okay so far? All right, so that's the first one I want to point out to you guys. I'm just trying to grab more colors. The second one I want to point out to you guys are the alcohols. So that's your OH. This one says you should expect a peak between 3200 and 3550. And this one is a very broad peak, or sorry, I should say very broad trough. So it's going to be quite wide. So the example that I have is this guy over here. So that there is an OH. Now if I look over here, is that guy an OH? No, because it's not broad. This guy over here also has an OH. And again, make a note of where you see it. That's roughly at, so this one's at 3391, which falls between that 320035. So that's the wavelength you're looking at. This one here looks like it's about 3000. Now, something to keep in mind when you are looking at these guys. For the alcohols, so 
So if we're thinking about functional groups, we can start figuring out what's what now. So you see how in this one I have no alcohol component to it? So that tells me when I'm looking at that, that this fingerprint here tells me you either, either have an aldehyde or ketone. You see how I figured that out? This guy over here, you see how it's missing the 1700 trough? And it just has the OH. If I think about functional groups that have OH and only the OH, that is my alcohol. Now this one over here, I see it has an OH and a acetyl bond O, and they are together, so that's my carboxylic acid. Another color. So this, when you do the combo, is a carboxylic acid. So C, you have the double bond O, and you have the OH, making it a carboxylic acid. Something to note with these carboxylic acids is that the OH goes a little bit down to the right, because you see how this is near 3,000, whereas this one is near um, 33,000. So when you have this combination, it tends to shift it downwards. The other thing to note is that it starts to crash into the CH. So it shifts downwards, and it's kind of fusing with the CH. That's how I know that's a carboxylic acid. You can have a situation where you have two functional groups, and that is an alcohol and an aldehyde on two separate carbons. If that happened, it would stay more like these two. You still have both, but you wouldn't see the crashing. This one here, crashing together. Are we okay so far? I'm talking about squiggly lines, and I know that can be really irritating. <laughs> All right, so we've done those two. The other thing we need to look at is the amines and the amides. So with the amines, you can see that there's another peak uh, roughly at the same position as the alcohols. So that's a little annoying that they're near the same spot. However, they have very different peaks from each other. When we talk about amines, there are two different versions that we talk about. We talk about the primary and we talk about the secondary. So let me unpack what that means. Primary is referring to uh, an amine that has N, H, and then a C, and then a C. It only has one, hy uh, one hydrogen. Secondary, this is a little bit different from what you guys know as primary, secondary, and tertiary when it comes to the alcohols and the haloalkanes. This nitrogen has two hydrogens attached to it and one carbon. So this one has two hydrogens. So it's the hydrogens that make it? The hydrogens that make this one when it classifies. So just watch out for that, that it's different from the others, which is a little irritating. Now, a thing to keep in mind is that if you have an amine or an amide with only one, you're going to get one peak, whereas if you have an amine with two hydrogens, then you're going to get two peaks, or an amide with two. This one's very characteristic, because when you're looking at it, again, it's in that same region. So if I was looking at it, it's probably roughly about... 3,500, and that's within the range of an amine. What you'll notice is that if it's a pri or if it's a secondary, you will have two little troughs. You see how there's one, two, one, two. Therefore, uh, secondary amine. Now, this one and this one are in the same region, but be mindful that they look very different. This one is a broad kind of trough. This one is like two little ones, and it's not as uh, deep with the absorption value. <laughs> so shorter. If you had a primary amine, then it would just be one. Yes, Sorry, amine. It's like a G. Sorry. All right. Again, we look to see, does it have something at 1,700? No. This doesn't count as an, um, a carbonyl. It's not deep enough. All right. Well, let me go look over at this guy, though. Do you see how you have that double troughed again? So that is, again, 
your tooth. secondary. It looks like a tooth. Like a tooth? Yeah, it does look like a tooth. Do you notice how this one is suddenly deeper than this one? Mm. And how this one also has the carp bottle? So when I combine these two bits of information, I then know I have an amide. You're running out of colors? You can steal my colors if you need. <laughs> okay, I was like, I'm just looking at squiggle lines. I don't know what you're talking about. The other thing that I'll point out with the carbonyl compared to the carboxylic acid carbonyl, because you can see how these, like, first off, you don't have them crashing into the CH. And then the second thing is that this carbonyl becomes really wide, whereas this one stays sharp. I don't know if that helps you kind of figure out which one's which, but that's kind of my suggestion. Doesn't crash. And I should write that in darker green. Doesn't crash. Also, C double bond O is wider. Whereas in this guy, it stays sharp. And it crashes together. All right, and that covers most of them. There are a few more for me to talk about, which aren't easy to find on the IR spectra. So I'll run through that. But again, like I said, the resource sheet is here. It should be roughly in that ballpark. It may not be at times. It may be a little bit higher or a little bit lower, and that just kind of depends on what else is attached to that carbon molecule. But more or less, you should find them in that rough area. Use this and the shape to figure out what you got. All right. There are a couple more on there that I need to help you identify. Let me get a different color. I'm just trying to think which one I haven't used. Oh, orange I have not used. Okay. There's a couple on here for the IR spectra that will be hard to see, and so there's different techniques to find it. Alkanes uh, versus alkenes. If I gave you an alkane or alkene, I will give you the empirical formula. What is the difference between those two things? Let me tell you. I'll grab another piece of paper. Actually, maybe it's worth keeping there. <laughs> All right. So I'm just trying to think of a number. Um, let's say I have C3H6C3H8. So these are examples. Oh, no, that's wrong. That's not what I want to use. Let's use four. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to find a number that's divisible. Uh, eight. And that would be 10. Is that divisible? It said 10. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Change my numbers. That's a 4 and an 8 and a 4 and a 10. Eight. Now, this is known as your molecular formula. If you guys remember when I was trying to talk about the difference between the alkanes and the alkenes is the whole uh, times 2 plus 2. So in this case, you see how the ratio is uh, 1 to 2. Four carbons times two, eight. Whereas this one's ratio is one to two plus two. Are we okay with that so far? All right, that's my molecular formula. An empirical formula is a simplified version of it, so you're doing some division. So if I was to divide this by four, is C one H two, whereas I was to simplify this one, I would divide it by two. That'd be C two H five. So this here is the simplified formula. That's my empirical. So when we are talking about empirical versus molecular formula, empirical is the simplified version of the molecular. It's basically like I've taken it a fraction and I've divided it up. So in this case, I've got 4 and 8. I have divided it by 2 to get to my empirical formula because that's the most simplified version that I could have. In this case, I had 4 and 10, and so I have... Sorry, I divided this one by 4. And this one I divided by 2. 
So what will happen if you have an alkane or an alkene is I will give you the empirical formula and from there you can figure out the ratios and figure out if there's a double bond present or not. So that's how I would give you the alkenes and alkanes. Are we okay with that so far? I'm really sorry if it doesn't make sense. We'll see some practice. So just be mindful that you're checking the formulas for those two guys. You're just basically checking the ratio. Uh, the last one that we have that I haven't talked about yet, I'm just trying to figure out what color I haven't used yet. So we've done the alkanes, we've done the alkenes. I don't think we've done the halo alkanes, we've done all the others. All right, halo alkanes, you will find on the math spec. Then I'll teach you that next lesson. Yes. So we're going to put a pin in that for now. All right, questions, concerns, comments? Other than, miss, I have no idea what's going on. All right, the best way to get good at this is to practice it. So I'm going to put up a GIMP kit. <laughs> and you guys are just going to see lots of molecules, and you're going to figure out which functional group is there. Okay? Yay!